Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Rashmi. I'm one of the family physician working in King's College Hospital, London, Dubai, which is based in Dubai Hills uh, area in Dubai. Um, today we'll be going to the topic of menopause and how to cope through it. Okay, when I was thinking through it, I I realized that okay, to in order to understand a woman who's going through menopause, it's very important for us to understand how these hormones are affecting every time the women, especially how do they change during the menopause? And with the changes in the hormones, how women get affected. When we understand these things, it becomes easy for us to understand what she's going through and also able to understand the symptoms. And then we can figure out what we can do to help her. Uh, Along with that, if we have time, we'll also go through what are the medical options of hormones and other things. OK, uh, so basically what is menopause? Menopause is defined by medically as. A 12 periods of 12 months of no period. Uh, towards the end of menstrual cycles for any woman. Usually it happens around age of 50. But some people can have early menopause which is less than 45. So in that case, usually they wait for 24 months of no periods when they miss period for 24 months. That's when they medically declare that you have reached menopause. But during this period around 50 before before two, three years and after two, three years after 50 or after stopping the period or two, three years, years before stopping the period, we call a perimenopausal period as well. And early menopause can happen to people because of hereditary. They have families uh, where mother and grandmother had early menopause and it can be following a surgery where women had other problems and they ended up having their ovaries and home removed. It can also happen with chemotherapy and radiotherapies. So I want you to see this slide and if you see how estrogen and progesterone, two predominant hormones in women, how do they affect us? So basically estrogen is there from the beginning of menstrual cycle and it peaks up till the ovulation happens. And after that it starts slowing down and it stays in the lower level for the second half of the period. Whereas progesterone's job is to prepare your lining of the ohm and to prepare the ohm to pregnancy. So it peaks up after the ovulation and it it goes to a peak and then when there's no conception, it comes down. So this is up and down is there every month for a woman. And if we look at the broader picture of how hormone is changing in a woman's life, you can see that the progesterone is one in the green. If it's not clear, uh, you can see it's very much in a rhythmic way up and down every month. And if you see estrogen during the teen and puberty, you can see that it's a bit up and down, but it's getting steadier with the time. And all through the menstrual cycles, it stays more or less the time with little fluctuations. And you can see on the last part, the red lines, red dotted lines is the estrogen. You can see how erratic it is. It's all over the place. It can be up, it can be down, and it just goes on for two, three years before it dies down with the menopause. We think this estrogen and progesterone is usually related to reproduction and maturations and it's all around that part. But no, the estrogen has a huge effect on human brain. If you see, it's though made from the ovaries by stimulation of the brain, but it circulates back in the bloodstream and it reaches and affects every part of the brain. Like thalamus is a part of the brain where temperature is controlled, body temperature is controlled. Amygdala, where our emotions are controlled. Hippocampus, where people process their information and keep them stored and memorize when they need it. And prefrontal cortex is the outer part of our brain, which is the function which is the place for our executive functions when we say lateral thinking, analytical thinking, decision making. All these areas of the brain can be affected by levels of estrogen, whether it's up and down. 
So with these basics, we can see how women feel through the menopause and how it is happening. So the main symptoms of menopause is many, many women complain heart flushes. When I say heart flushes, how it happens is, as I mentioned, the estrogen reaches the thalamus and it, the thalamus gets really confused with this up and down uh, estrogen levels and it feels that even slightest temperature change in the environment, it feels bodies too hot, so it needs to release the heart. So it increases the body temperature to let it go and then women feel these hot flushes. How they feel, it's, it's like a, it's an instant, no warning sign. Out of nowhere, women feel terribly hot, usually upper part of the body and their face and cheeks can go red for some people. For some people, their heart races like anything, they have heart palpitations and they can feel short of breath as well. And they can also feel very, very anxious with it. So imagine you're in an AC room and suddenly you feel hot and sweaty when everybody else is sitting comfortably. It can be very daunting, uh, very intimidating uh, to many women. Uh, especially if they are in a uh, jobs where they need to be public figures like celebrities or performers or if you're doing a presentation at work, this can be very, very intimidating. When these hot flushes happens, then body once it gets hot up, it realizes actually it doesn't need to and then it needed to sweat it out and they're followed by a huge sweating episode. Women can be suddenly have these hot flushes and drenched in sweat in an AC room. That's what it feels to them. When these things happen at night, many women wake up in the middle of the night and they struggle to go back to bed. The hot flushes itself can cause sleeping difficulties, but otherwise without hot flushes as well, people can suffer from insomnia, which is sleeping. They might struggle to fall asleep. They might struggle to stay asleep, wake up in the middle of the night. Some people have early morning wakenings and they can't go back to bed. So when this is happening, you can imagine lack of sleep and these hot flushes can cause a lot of headaches uh, for women. Tiredness, tiredness can be counter effect of everything, lack of sleep, hot flushes and sweats, but Tiredness can happen on its own because uh, estrogen have an effect on the motivation and energy level centers in the brain. And when estrogen level is low, women can feel much, much more tired than normal. So when these things happen, women can become irritable and have more swings. As I said, it can be again counter effect of all these things. Also, estrogen have a direct effect on the amygdala, which is the mood center for us. So what happens is usually we have happy hormones, which affects our brain and keeps us happy, serotonin. And what estrogen does it, it stops serotonin getting destroyed. So serotonin stays longer in the brain and you stay happier for longer. But when estrogen levels are very low, the serotonin is made and it's destroyed very quickly. So the serotonin level can go along with the estrogen level up and down. So that's how women at that age period can be OK in a minute or in a day, and there can be a next day or next hour where they can be very down and the mood can be irritable, feeling low. So that's what happens. So this direct effect of estrogen and also other effects of estrogen causing symptoms can make her mood very unstable. So imagine a woman who has going through this and usually when you're getting to 50, women would have had the children who might be teenagers or they're going through stress and they're settling into the pace of life. And she would usually have a elderly parents or in-laws to look after. She have a house to run, husband to look after and a career. And even in the career at that stage with their capabilities, they would have reached and taken some more responsibilities at workplace as well. So they're handling, juggling all these things and they're managing okay and this menopause kicks in and with all these symptoms, they might feel that they're not coping the way they used to. They're not able to manage the things the way they used to. Suddenly they feel lost. They feel what happened to me. They get worried that happened to me. I was not like this. I was never like this. 
and this is not me. Uh, that feeling itself can be very, very hard on a woman uh, to deal with menopause. Along with this, these are the commonest things what we discuss, but it also have other effects uh, on women body. They usually lose uh, sex drive and not interested much. It also affects local, local effect on vaginal dryness and itching and it, it, irritation, which makes them feel uh, not wanting sex that often, which can affect their relationship. And also they will be worried about the fact that, OK, I'm not interested. I don't know what my partner is thinking. So there will be one, they are dealing with the problems and also they are worried about the consequences of the problems in their relationship. And as I mentioned, these hormones have a huge effect on everything. So they, they are very much linked with the pelvic floor muscle. The pelvic floor muscles are the muscles which are holding our own bladder and the bowel as well in like in a basket and it goes loose during pregnancy and towards the end of uh, uh, pregnancy too so that it makes it easy for the birth but the same thing happens when menopause happens and their hormone level the, the strength in the pelvic floor muscles goes down which will make women very prone for prolapses and they have a lot of urinary symptoms they can leak when they cough, sneeze, or they run or lift anything heavy. We call that a stress incontinence, which can be very embarrassing and also make their confidence very low. They can also find it very difficult to hold back whenever they get urgency to go. They have to rush to the toilet. And that limits what they can do, what they can't do outdoor, and can make them uh, less confident again. So along with this, we all know that with aging skin and hair changes, but there is a drastic change. There can be a fall and dryness of skin and wrinkles in the skin with loosening of the estrogen. And the other very important thing is its effect on the bone. Uh, the estrogen helps to keep our bones stronger. And post menopause, after the menopause, many women suffer from thinning of the bone, what we call osteopenia or more severe form osteoporosis. This will lead them to have aches and pains, and also they can easily fracture. We have a blessing women out of all these hormonal changes through our life. One blessing we have is it is protective of us for cardiovascular diseases with risk of heart attack is low in women compared to men till they reach 50. Um, that changes drastically. When all these things happen, um, many women can fight through it, but some women can easily get into depression and anxiety. It is a lot of researches have been done and it said that menopause can make many women very prone for depression and anxiety. So it becomes very important. We watch for these signs and symptoms during that period. So how do we cope with all this? As I said, knowing what's happening and why it is happening makes a huge difference for the woman herself and also people around her. I'm sure all of us have a woman around us who's going through menopause. It can be a colleague, it can be a your wife or partner, and it can be your aunt or mom, grandmother, somebody around us very close to us will be around this age in our life cycle. So it becomes very important for us to share this with people who don't know share what happens to her and it's important for the women to change to share this with family and friends what she's feeling why she's feeling and ask for the help and this is the time for major lifestyle changes if things are not working then go for the expert advice like see your doctor okay first we will talk about what we, as a woman we can do to help ourselves if we are going through this on this tip, same thing applies. If you have no woman who's not aware of this, you can tell her to try these things out when she's experiencing menopause. Regular exercise and healthy eating. These are the two, uh, I would say, mantras or two prescriptions, which are always on top of every doctor's list for any diseases. You take diabetes or high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, 
to reduce the risk of cancer, uh, to for the depression, mental health, anything. We say regular exercises because there is huge, huge, huge evidences to say that regular exercises can make a difference to these conditions. When we say regular exercises, what is it? Uh, according to us, medically, we say 30 minutes of exercise every day, at least five times a week with an intensity where you would be sweating and your heart would be, heart rate would be high. So we, either you do five times a week, 30 minutes, or you can combine to make it three times a week, an hour each time, or 40 minutes, four times a week, whatever works out for you. And any form of exercise, it could be running, it could be biking, it could be swimming, strength and conditioning, whatever you choose to, or walking, but some part of physical activity is very, very important. And the healthy eating. When we say healthy eating, the very big highlights are, are healthy fives, what we call as five portions of fruits and vegetables in a day, minimum. You can have more, excellent, but minimum you are supposed to have five portions. It can be mix of fruits, vegetables, dried fruits and cut down on your processed food, oily foods, and the processed carbohydrates we call like sugary foods. And that is the major, major thing. And also increase your protein intake. Some of the proteins like soya, chickpeas, flax seeds, these are some of the contents which are put in the picture. They're known to have what we call a plant estrogen. We call phytoestrogen. There's no evidence to say that they make a huge difference, but they say some of the women have felt that it made a difference to them. No research has been done to say how much of these you have to eat uh, to get that estrogen, natural estrogen, but there's no evidence. But these are harmless form of food. Uh, they don't cause you any harm. So if you think you can include them in the diet, even with this slight amount, it might make a difference to your symptoms. And other tips like we say, dress up in layers. Uh, if you're going out for a dinner or a meeting, most of you are in AC rooms, instead of having full sleeve one sweatshirt or a cardigan, I would say have a sleeveless top and then have a jacket. So if you feel different with your body temperature, you'll be able to take it off. And also we advise if, you, if they can carry a spare cloth, because some women can be really drenched in the sweat where they wouldn't be able to process and proceed with whatever they're doing. So it, it becomes important to change. And wherever possible, keep the room temperature lower uh, because they are very sensitive for the heat during that time. Avoid the hot drinks like alcohol, coffee, tea, or spicy foods but instead of switch to things like cold drinks, that helps a lot more than the other ones. Sleeping is an issue, but we always advise avoid sleeping tablets because what happens is because of the hot sweats and insomnia, you can't sleep anyway. And on top, you're taking sleeping tablets, which makes you very groggy and kind of mental block, which makes you more irritable because you can't get sleep when you're taking the sleeping tablets as well. It becomes very, very tricky to deal with it. That's more around the hot flushes. Even when it comes to mood, our top points on the list stays regular exercise and healthy eating. Because what has been told, uh, found through the researchers is when you do exercise, there is release of serotonin in your brain, which is the happy hormone. So regular exercises would definitely help uh, anybody, even if you're going through stress or menopause, or depression and anxiety, it is the key. One of the first steps you have to do is to go for regular exercises and healthy eating. When we say exercises, people think always about, uh, as I said, running, swimming, where your heart rate races, but it also becomes important to consider other form of exercises like yoga, Pilates, which are more like slow phase, calming exercises we call. Because what happens when you're running or biking, your heart is racing, your body is racing, your brain is racing. You always think fast. But when you do this, they ask you to focus on your breathing. They ask you to slow down. 
and that becomes very important if you are having mood swings and stress or anxiety. So putting these kind of calming exercises in your schedule helps a lot, lot. So you can switch between three days of running or cardiovascular exercises and two, three days of calming exercises would be fantastic. And mindfulness and meditation, I would say it's not for menopause, it's for everybody because we live in such a fast paced life now. Our mind is constantly on the go. It becomes very, very important to give that break for our mind, which we can do through mindfulness and meditation. There's a huge, huge, huge amount of uh, researchers to say when we meditate or practice mindfulness, so many of our brain functions calms down, our breathing slows down, our heart rate slows down, which has got a very positive effect on our brain, our stress levels, and also other uh, diseases like high blood pressure and diabetes, many things. I know it, it's very common for women to say uh, meditation is not something I can do because as a woman, we are so used to multitask. Uh, we are on the go. We have kids, we have husband, we have house, we have a career and we have a social life. We have to contribute to society. So we are so used to multitask and work all the time. So for us sitting and closing our eyes and not doing anything feels very daunting. And people feel I'm closing my eyes. I'm trying to meditate. My mind wanders off what to pack for kids tomorrow. Is there anything to be replaced in the house? What to present tomorrow to work? So these things, won't, but don't worry. It's, it's not as hard as we think. There are good classes for meditation. Also, there's loads of information. Look, I think uh, that's an issue that we have frozen. And once you start realizing the difference it's making to you, you would want to do it more. And I'm sure many women, especially if you're listening to this and if you're going through menopause, you're going to kill me for saying uh, learn new hobbies because you're like, oh my God, doctor, how can you say this? This is already weird multitasking and we are going through this and you ask us to pick something else for the with the new time and energy. That's the beautiful thing about the hobbies. You don't have to be best at it. That's why it's called hobbies. Because we always try to be best mother, best wife, best homemaker, best at the career. So in this, you don't have to prove anybody what how good you are with this. It's just for yourself. It can be anything simple as gardening or sewing or painting, any hobbies you wanted to learn and forgot, or it could be just going on contributing somewhere else to teaching a kid or working in a community. Because these one, when you know you can be yourself, you're not judged, you don't have to judge yourself, that gives you a bit of breathing space for your brain and self-esteem. If you can find some time for this, I would say that's an excellent th thing to do during this phase of life. And probably it's the best time because after menopause, probably your kids would have gone up and grown. You will have a bit more free time and you, it makes your transition life much easier. And strengthening pelvic floor muscles. If you're going for the slow pace exercises like Pilates and yoga, they usually are strengthening and conditioning. They focus on your core strengthening. When the core strengthening comes, they also teach you how to do pelvic floor muscles because it's part of core strength. But if you're not doing any of those exercises, I think it becomes very, very vital to pick up on pelvic floor muscles. Uh, we call Kegels exercises. If you go on YouTube, you can see plenty of how to do it. If you can make it a routine to do a couple of times a day or, or every day, once a day for on a regular basis, because if you have prolapse or incontinence, that can really, really affect your confidence and if you can prevent it through the pelvic floor exercises and you don't have to go for surgeries, that would be a huge impact uh, towards your positive life. So I would say if you can incorporate along with uh, exercises is great. If not, you can make it as a part of your mindfulness because you have to focus when you have to do pelvic floor exercises. Um, so it can go hand in hand where you're doing your pelvic floor exercises and you're practicing your 
mindfulness. Another things are like if you're having dry vaginal dryness, using lubricants are fine. You don't have to have the expensive or fragrance ones. The basic simple things like KY jellies, plain lubricants can make a huge impact. It can help you feel wet and then it makes uh, sexual activity much more uh, less daunting for women at that age. And how what we can do, people who are not going through menopause, but they know somebody else is around us. As I said, one or the other person is around us going through this, what we should do. As I said, first thing I would say, if you want to be more moral or spiritual, I would say I would want to respect such women. Anybody closer to 50, the woman would have raised a family or made a, and made a career made a home and looked after the elders. So if she would have done all this along with uh, all battling she has done along for the hormones to pregnancy, to the puberty and the menstruations. So to get there, she has she has been through some battles. So I would say look at her with respect and don't stigmatize because it's very, very common uh, in some cultures where they can easily say, OK, uh, my wife is shouting at me or my boss or colleague has been rude to me. Oh my God, she's going through menopause. She's taking it on me. Don't stigmatize. Don't make it like it's a bad thing for a woman to happen. Also, if your if your wife or if somebody was very close to you feeling this and they're looking like they're not themselves, their behavior is changing. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to be scared that something is wrong with them because it's a natural process. You don't have to try and fix everything here. Uh, it's a phase, she'll get over it, but what you need to do is to understand and support her. I would say don't personalize because you, the woman, like if your wife, she is very close to you and used to have good time and then suddenly she's a bit distanced from you. You don't have to think it's you. It's just the process she's going through. Knowing what she's going through makes it easy for you to understand her. At the same time, you have to, don't have to generalize. Your mom is telling you off. You don't have to be snobbish and say, oh, she's going through menopause. So all her anger is not menopause. So you need to communicate in an appropriate way to understand her and ask her why she's feeling the way she's feeling. And being empathetic. So if you're a smoker, you imagine you were smoking 20 cigarettes a day, and then next day you were asked to stop or you're given two in some days, four in some days, how would you feel? That's what happens to this woman. And it, whatever you are happy with, whatever you're doing on a regular basis, how it feels when you're taking it away, not completely, there's on and off. You don't know when it will be given to you, when it's taken to you. Or best way to coordinate is think back how miserable and irritable you were as a teenager, whether you're a boy or a girl. You went through that phase very for a short time and you had a supporting parents. They took on all your anger or irritation because they were mature, they, you had the supporting system. Probably for a woman at this stage, the supporting system is a bit weak because they might have kids in that phase where they are going through their own stress of life, building their life, and the parents might be weak and old for her. Um, men could be busy with their career and running the home. So be, be a supporting system for her. They lack at that stage. And you have to be really patient with her. So if you if she says instead of with the plans of you planning to go out or planning to do something and she minute last minute she pulls out saying I'm not really feeling good. I don't have energy level being patient and understanding. Try and encourage her uh, that OK, we'll switch the plan, make it more easy, a bit more relaxed. But at the same time, don't push her. Be a bit patient with her. So I said communication is the key. Even if you think it's her hormones, once she calms down, ask her, is it your hormones? Are you OK? Or if you think something else is happening, then ask her directly. Are you reacting because of your hormones or you have any other issues? You have any problems? So being open, being honest and asking directly would make a huge difference to resolve so many problems around this. 
I would say it's a big time for everybody to change the lifestyle changes because she's going through that. This is the time to think for you as well as a partner or as a colleague or as a friend or as a daughter. Is this the time to make some difference to our lifestyle? Because she would be better off walk, taking a walk rather than sitting, going for a smoke or going for a drink or being in a pub. So this is the time you can say, we want to still spend time together. Can we go for a walk? Or do something a leisure activity outside than being in going for a meal, which can be daunting experience sometimes if it's a spicy hot food and a lot of people around, or avoid the alcohol and cigarettes. This would be the right time to switch to healthy style, not only for our people around her as well. And offer her to help because she has too much in her plate as normally. And along with that, she has to deal with the menopause. So I would say see her with empathetic eye whenever you can have her else. Just say it can be as simple as getting a cold ring for her or. If you are a daughter or son, giving her a little massage for her. Anything like that would really make a difference to how she feels because she will feel very supported. And when it comes to intimacy in relationship, uh, as I mentioned, don't make it personal and what she's going through is a phase and it's not because of what happened in the relationship. It's because how she's feeling within herself. So be open about it, honest about it and speak to her and be supportive to her. That helps to keep the relationship stronger. So when women can't go through this alone, they tried everything and if they're struggling as a woman, if you feel you've done it all and but you're still struggling, it it can be variable for different people because some people it can be mild, some people it can be severe. Also depends on what you do. If you have a bit more time where you can relax, it's different. If you are a person who have a high responsible role at work and even a simple thing as hot flushes can be very, very daunting. Or the mood swings can be affecting your relationships. At that time, I would say if it's gone behind what you can help yourself, please, please see your doctor. Uh, and if you are a partner or a friend or a son for these women, I would say encourage them because some women can be hard on themselves and they say, OK, all women go through this. I should get through this. I don't want to take medications for this. It's a natural process. Uh, so it becomes very important for the people around her to explain to her and ask her to seek help from the experts and that will help. At the same time, if women volunteers to go and ask for help, you don't want to be the person as a partner or colleague to say, oh no, you don't have to because everybody goes through this. Don't try to stop her. So see what she feels and encourage her to take as much as help available for her. So when you go to doctors, usually doctors go through the history, what you're experiencing and also how it is affecting your life. That becomes the major thing. Some doctors might do some hormonal tests, but honestly the hormones are everywhere because as I showed the graph, it can be high, low. So evidence based wise, medically hormones don't play a huge role in diagnosing perimenopausal symptoms. It's from what you tell, what you feel, that's what matters most than the blood test. So doctors might give you option of going on hormone replacement therapy. And if you don't like the feel of it, they might offer you options of non-hormonal replacement medications. So what are these? The hormone replacement therapy is basically the same estrogen and progesterone, um, similar to your natural cycles, uh, based on whether you had stopped the cycle, whether you're still having menstruations, whether you have a home or not, doctors pick different form of estrogens. But basically, there are estrogen and progesterone combination in different forms and it can be discussed with your doctors what is right one for you and doctors will help you involve you in choosing the right one. What are the benefits? These ones um, relieve some of the symptoms, especially the hot flushes. Many, many women have found that it helps with the hot flushes, night sweats and the mood swings. And this can be a huge debilitating uh, symptoms for some of the women and it becomes very important for them to take the HRT in order to function normally. It also helps with uh, vaginal dryness, 
and increases libido and it has got some protective effect on osteoporosis. It prevents the thinning of the bone. But preventing thinning of the bone lasts only when you're taking this hormone replacement therapy, but it vanishes once we stop it. All these symptoms are the same. It's usually given for a phase where we make it a bit more easy and slowly wean it off. Uh, but some women do experience uh, symptoms of menopause when they come off the HRT. So it becomes very hard for some of the women to come off HRT because they start experiencing the symptoms. As any other medication, these do come up with uh, some side effects and risk. Uh, there is slight increased risk of stroke, a clot in the leg, which is DVT, and the breast cancer. Though it has to be mentioned, unless you have a previous risk and family histories, these risks are not very significant. When you go to your doctors, they would be able to discuss precise figures. They're like two in thousand kind of numbers. It's very, very minimal. So actually, I would say these risk factors shouldn't be the reason to stop the HRT if it's benefiting you to improve your quality of life by controlling these symptoms. And doctors might also give you some of the non-hormonal options. The clonidine is one of the things which is very much used in some of the women where HRT is contraindicated, like women with breast cancer history or they had a heart attack, we can't use HRT. So that time clonidine has been very helpful in some of the women to reduce hot flushes. The SSRIs, NRIs are the ones we use for depression and anxiety medications, but it has been shown that it has been very, very helpful in some of the women to help with their mood swings and insomnia uh, and the anxiety. And it, as I said, this is like you're going through a bumpy road and these medications come like a bit more of a suspension for your vehicle, I would say, till you get over it and then it can be weaned off. These are not addictive and these are not come with a new side effects. So you can take it for a phase when things are much harder. We know women who have done well with the menopause for two years and they have a, a tragedy in the family or they have a stressful situation with the finance, something like that where they need that extra support and they use this medication just to get over that period and then, then they come off. Even gabapentin, which is used mainly for neuropathic pains, has been proven to help with some of the HRT symptoms. Uh, menopausal symptoms, sorry. That's what I had to say. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please ask and I'll try to clarify them. Thank you so much, Doc, for the session. I'll read out the questions for you, for your answers. Okay. So yeah. the first question, Doc, does pre-menopause uh, to menopause also leads to uh, digestive issues? Mm -hmm. So are they asking whether it leads to digestive issue? Yeah, so possibly the question is, are there any symptoms related to digestive okay. issues? Yeah, um, with perimenopause and menopause, it's not much uh, evidence-based relation to digestive system. We have not come across many, many people saying about change in the bowel habits or a bit more bloating. Anything like that is related, directly related to the menopause. But what happens is, is the age transition as well. So many women might have uh, different comorbidities developing. They might be developing inflammatory bowel disease or IBS, which related to stress. But I would say, any digestive symptoms, don't wait. See your doctor. Don't put it on the menopause. Understood, Doc. Uh, doc, next question is, uh, the, the member is going on for an HRT, the, human, uh, the hormone replacement therapy. Will that help stop? or reverse some perimenopause symptoms such as hair loss and joint pain? Yeah, um, HRT, as I mentioned before, is basically we are prolonging your hormonal days. Like HRT is nothing but the hormones. 
it's, it's a synthetic hormones, processed hormones, similar to your estrogen and progesterone. So we are trying to postpone your menopause. That's what we are doing. So it does it does have a positive effect on the bone, skin, and some of the symptoms. Um, but it doesn't have much effect on. Sorry, other thing you mentioned was the hair loss. Yeah, it can help with the hair loss because when you take estrogen, if your hair loss has happened because of the loss of estrogen, it helps as well. Yeah. Is there a supplement you recommend for menopause or perimenopause? OK, yeah, it's a very good question because uh, I can see that if you go online, there's huge, huge amount of supplements. As a medical, as a doctor, I would say stay away from them because I know people like take B6, which is OK, because I know the composition is only vitamin B6. Anything natural like natural food I mentioned about chickpeas, soya beans or plain seeds, those are OK because you can see what is there. When it's labeled, we don't know what is there. There are supplements like Black Kosh, uh, John Watts. They say it has got the harm on and it helps. But there's no evidence to say what level, what amount you're supposed to take to help with HR, your symptoms and what level is dangerous. Uh, there's not enough evidence, so it can be dangerous when you overdo it as well. So I say stay away from the supplements because these supplements, most of them don't go through FDA, which is food uh, regulation body in America, which uh, food and drug regulation. What they do is any medication like HRT before coming to the market, before it's prescribed by your doctor, it goes through various trial phases, whether it's safe, whether it works, whether it's worth taking, um, and then we prescribe it. But whereas these supplements, they most of them don't through, go through the FDA. Uh, people recommend, people plan, and people, everybody has got a brand of their own supplements now. So I would say, without discussing with your physician, don't take them. And Especially we also don't know if you're taking a blood pressure medication, diabetic medication, cholesterol medication. We don't know how these supplements affect you as well, interact with them. So any supplements which is not in the natural process like food, avoid them, discuss with your doctor and then take it from there. Yeah, next one. Is it advisable to eliminate dairy products from your diet during perimenopause or menopause? Oh, definitely not. Uh, I would say that's the wrong information because dairy doesn't have anything to do with your menopause. I know I hear, uh, sorry to say that I hear a lot about the gut health in Dubai, uh, but no, dairy becomes even more important during your menopause because as I said, you have effect on your bone. Your bone can go on thinning phase it loses its strength so it becomes very important to take enough calcium and vitamin d which is provided by your dairy if you're eating if you didn't have dairy allergies before or you don't have a lactose intolerance before stopping dairy products to help with menopausal symptoms is not going to make any difference so i would say don't do that just for the sake of menopause unless you have other problems yeah that's done what is the recommended amount of exercise and activity for women who are in menopause? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah, what is the recommended amount of exercise or activity for women who are in menopause? Yeah, as I mentioned during the presentation, when we say activity, it has to be minimum 30 minutes, five times a week. And it, with the intensity of where you feel sweating, you, I'm not saying that if you go in summer, you'll sweat in five minutes, but in a normal room temperature or normal temperature, you have to sweat enough uh, during that activity. Because if you take leisure walk in for 30 minutes, you won't sweat. So you have to sweat and your heart rate has to go up. That kind of intensity is required to have the positive effect of exercise. As I mentioned, either you do five times a week or you make it 40 minutes four times a week or one hour three times a week whatever is convenient for you 
but intense exercises three to four hours a week is required. That's when you start seeing the positive effect of exercises in the perimenopausal age. As I said, not just the menopause, everything, everything, whether it's the weight or the mood or other chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, cancer, anything, exercise is the medication. So one must adapt to it. Thank you. Can you medicine that strengthen the pelvic floor muscle? Yeah, uh, the pelvic floor muscles is very, very important. With the menopause, it loses its strength. You're prone for prolapse and urinary incontinence, either urge or stress incontinence. The way you do is, we call it a Kegels exercise. You have to hold your pelvic floor muscles tight and your tummy tight the way you are holding your urine back. Suppose if you're urgent and you're outside, you're not don't want to go. You tend to hold it that way. You have to hold it, count it for tens, twenties, thirties, how long you can hold it and then release it slowly and repeat the exercises. Do it in sets, at least three sets every time you do it, tens of three sets. And if you can do it more, the better, but at least minimum twice a day, every day, three sets of them. That would help to stimulate your muscles and keep the strength and which is very, very important. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of YouTube good videos where they can teach you all. You can do along with the counts, how to hold it and how long to hold it as well. Uh, there are quite good number of queries regarding is this session recorded? Yes, if you uh, click on the same link while you join for this session, after this session, you can refer to the recordings. OK, then going to the next question, Doc, how long does MP normally last for? Uh, you mean menopause? Yeah. Yeah, menopause, it varies so much. It can be very less intense for some people. They went through menopause, they didn't even realize it. Some people, it can be intense. And the same thing happens with the duration. I would say ideally, most of the people, it'll at least two years, a couple of years before they start stop the period, their periods go irregular. They start feeling these symptoms. It, it is with a various intensity. There are good months, bad months. It is up and down and they go through that for usually a couple of years and then it fades, fades away. Average period is two years, but it can stretch depending on the person. It can be longer or a bit shorter. Thank you. They say after menopause, it is difficult to lose weight even if you are exercising. Is it a myth or is it a true? I would say it's a kind of myth because not the menopause. You can, if you can notice, actually losing weight becomes difficult after 35, age of 35. For some people, definitely at 40, most of us know. Because for many of us, our lifestyle doesn't change. What we don't, what we eat doesn't change, but our belly starts going bigger, whether it's a man or woman, and our shoulders stop and the chest stop drooping. That is the change of aging because our basal body metabolic rate starts slowing down at 40. Our muscles start dying, and muscles are the one which burns calories even when you're resting. So your muscle mass starts decreasing, and your fat composition goes up, which doesn't burn calories at all. Fat keeps storing. So then that's when it becomes. So it's not to do with the menopause. It's more to do with the age of whether man or woman after 40, it kicks in unless you are adapting in a change that you are continuing with strength and conditioning, building your muscles to keep enough muscle mass and keeping low fat. That's the only way to keep the weight down is change your lifestyle and work on it. Uh, yeah, it's not the menopause because even it happens to men. Is the age. Next one. Can you get pregnant when you are going through menopause? Yeah, very good question because um, as a, if you can remember the graph which we showed before, the hormones are very erratic. It's similar to your puberty. You are menstruating, but you might be producing egg in one cycle, not in that cycle. Same thing happens. We have women who got pregnant at 50 as well because 
that could be one that cycle where she made an egg and this released and it conceived. So till the age of 50 to officially you are stop the period for a year or so, you have the risk of pregnancy. So we always recommend people to use contraception till then. There is a risk of pregnancy for sure. Though it's low, but it's there. Next one. Can we accelerate the menopause process so that we don't need to go through this phase of four years? <laughs> okay, I wish I wish there was a magic wand here. No, uh, unfortunately, no, there's no. Process to accelerate it. Uh, people reach early menopause because of the surgeries, radiotherapies, as I mentioned, they lose their hormones. Uh, but they reached menopause early, they didn't accelerate it. Uh, because once you reach menopause, the effect is almost the same. You stabilize it. But what happens is you lose the protective benefit of estrogen and progesterone, which we have. So I would say always natural course is the best way. You don't have to accelerate it, but HRT is prolongs it. It's like it helps you to stabilize during that erratic period and then slowly, gradually we decrease the dose and we make it a bit more phased out, slow process than erratic process. That's what the HRT helps, but there is no process or medications where I can say two years of menopause is squeezed into six months and perimenopausal period is open, done and menopause is done and you can be off these symptoms. There's no process for that, unfortunately. Next one. Is yoga or strength training with weights recommended for women heading into perimenopause? Definitely. Uh, probably you would have got that from the presentation earlier. Yeah, there's, it's not only perimenopause, anybody, even men, uh, because when you're eating 40, you're already losing the muscle mass and the fat is accumulating around your belly. Belly fat is the bad fat. And the only way you could do is do the con conditioning and strengthening and conditioning because that's the way to build the muscles weight and yoga and uh, calming exercises are very important because I said it's got an effect on strengthening your muscles and also calming effect on the brain. So these are something as a must for women going through perimenopause, but definitely I would recommend for anybody going through stressful life. We want to keep the sanity in the past phase of our life. Uh, so it is definitely recommended. Next one. Can you please recap the symptoms of perimenopause as I missed the start of the webinar due to issues with joining links. So Doc, can you just uh, revise on the symptoms of menopause? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm trying to get back to the slides as well. So, yeah, and what age does uh, typically perimenopause uh, symptoms start? The perimenopausal symptoms usually starts when you're getting closer to 50. For some people it starts around 40, 45. For some people it can be 47, but it varies. As I mentioned earlier, the estrogen level really starts fluctuating during perimenopause. Uh, you said you missed earlier presentation. You can see the red dot is the estrogen and what it does it it's in a up and down through our cycle, but during perimenopause, it's really erratic. And this has got a huge effect on every part of our brain, whether it's temperature regulation, emotions, our memory, and how we think and make a decision. So that's how we start experiencing so many symptoms during perimenopause. The most commonly reported symptom is hot flushes. What happens is, um, our brain, which controls the temperature, gets really confused with up and down estrogen, and it feels suddenly this warm when there's no outside temperature change, and it want body to calm down, and it creates this hot flush to release the body temperature. So women, without any warning signs, suddenly feel like a heat wave in the, especially in the upper part of the body, and some of them go red in the face and cheeks and they can be sweating following that and their heart race can, heart can be racing. They might be feeling a bit short of breath. Many feel anxious as well. It all lasts for two to five minutes, but it can be very daunting depending on where they are, if they're public figures or they're doing a presentation. 
talking to the bosses and this happened, it can be very embarrassing and intimidating for uh, people. The other thing is nights where it's similar thing happens at night and insomnia, they have difficulty in sleeping, headaches, they feel very tired uh, because estrogen does affect our part of the brain, which increases our energy level and motivation as well. Because of estrogen effect on our mood centers, their mood can be up and down. They can have feeling low, sometimes managing okay. With all these symptoms, women can feel very tired and not coping as much as they used to. They were managing everything okay and then they reach 46 and suddenly they feel okay, things are out of control and they can't manage it, cope with everything going on. These are the very common um, symptoms which come across to us on day to day basis. The other effects of menopause are they do loss of libido and it can cause vaginal dryness, irritation and itching, which can make sex a less desirable thing for men in that age. And relaxation of pelvic floor muscles, uh, it loosens up so they can have tendency for prolapse and have a urgent stress incontinence. Basically, you leak when you are is strenuous, doing anything strenuous is like exercise or lifting heavy weight, coughing, sneezing, uh, that can make you leak, which can make you feel a bit underconfident. And when you're urgent, you can't hold it for long, you have to rush. As we mentioned, hair loss, skin drying and wrinkles can happen as well. And it also got a thinning effect on the bone. We call osteoporosis or osteopenia, depending on the severity. The bones start losing is strength. Um, that's one thing. And women lose that protective factor we have through our life that we have less prone for heart attacks compared to men of similar age. We lose that. And with all these changes, it's also proven that women are very, very prone for depression and anxiety at this stage of life. Uh, these are the very common, uh, also some of the severe symptoms which experience during perimenopausal stage. Yeah, anything else? Thank you. Next one. Doc, uh, next question is related to diet, so I'm not sure if you want to pick this question. The question is intermittent fasting is becoming popular these days. Does it help with menopause? OK, intermittent fasting doesn't directly help with the menopause. I know um, even some of our physicians are recommending it because there is a proven evidence that it improves your insulin resistance, uh, sugar levels in the body, and it has been proven that it helps with the pre-diabetic to postpone them becoming diabetes. So it's a overall, it's a beneficial effect on the health, but it doesn't have any direct impact on the menopause. It's not no evidence to say that um, intermittent fasting is beneficial or detrimental in menopause. No study has, has happened on that one. But definitely intermittent fasting is being promoted a lot more, even medically, uh, because it has got a positive effect on insulin resistance and blood sugar and weight loss. Next one. Well, how long a woman can take medication to reduce menopause symptoms? OK, a yeah, very good question, uh, but there's no definite answer because we usually tell women maximum of 10 years because we have so many women who are in their job roles, executives, it's very, very important for them to carry on as normal. But what happens is when you take it for more than 10 years, their accumulation risk of having breast cancer and stroke with a HRT becomes higher. The same thing applies when you're taking contraception, combined oral contraceptive pills. So when after certain period after certain years, your doctors start talking to you about reducing it. But how long is recommended? It varies from uh, women to women. Um, some take it for six months, some take it for a year. And when they feel they're out of the phase, when things are a bit more stable, they try to reduce the dose. So they be in really along with the patient, we discuss, OK, do you think it's time to reduce? And we reduce the dose to half and then the quarter and we slowly drop it. That's what makes the difference natural menopause, perimenopausal to HRT. It, with the natural perimenopausal, your hormones is very irregular erratic. With HRT, we stabilize it and slowly wean it down. So the process of feeling 
the changes become a bit more easily. You can easily handle it compared to without the HRD. So we, we, we know women who have been on it for two years, four years, five years, one year. So it varies from women to women. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I think there is a last comment uh, which is on a lighter note. Uh, which is menopause, mental anxiety, menopause, menstruation. Notice how women's problems all start with M E N. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I and think well. uh, we have completed all the questions so far, Doc. It was a very informative session. Uh, the most important thing we wanted to we wanted to create this awareness is it's a definitely a difficult time where females go through while they start and they will need support from the family members, the relatives, friends, and it's important that we know what uh, we are going through and uh, people around us know what we are going through so that we do not create conflicts. We have a better understanding. So thank you so much, uh, Doc, for your session. It was a very informative session. Thanks for your time. Thanks everyone for joining the session. Yeah, thank you very much, Veena. It was definitely very uh, innovative topic you picked and it shows the work culture in your place that you want to be open and you want to make people aware of it so that they can support each other better. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a excellent topic to be picked, I would say. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you so much.